It is it's mm-hmm. it's it's a war that ex- had, had, has existed in other parts of the world that is now coming to to Europe, even to North America and other parts of the world, where this virus, in my view, continues to spread, and now it's posing such a threat to everybody that we have to stand up and we have to realize what is happening and start doing something about it. Well, I think that the people who haven't realized it by now uh, are due for a big wake-up call soon because if I were to continue in this analogy, I would say that the the viral infection of this archontic factor uh, is is rampant. It is absolutely rapacious, and uh, it's going to reach the point very, very soon where people won't be able to ignore it. Uh, you you asked the question, which is a very valid question that might be raised as an objection uh, to our topic. You know, well, how do you know that this great danger, you know, that white genocide is real or, you know. Well, for one thing, the there are many things that point to the reality of it. We could talk for an hour about that. But I would just indicate one thing, that any sane person, of common sense can uh, acknowledge you can't be pro-white. You know, there's something about being pro-white that's taboo. Well, why should that be? You know, uh, you can be pro-Latino. You can celebrate African-American identity. You can celebrate Japanese identity. All these different ethnic identities on the planet can uh, celebrate themselves. But white people cannot. Why not? You know, why isn't it equilateral? You know, that already is an alarm sign. The other alarm sign is that uh, it's no secret. I mean, have you ever read the synagogue of Satan? You know, read the synagogue of Satan. Synagogue of Satan is a book that is just a compilation of quotes, right? gathered by this particular individual. I forget his name right now. Andrew Hitchcock, I think. Yeah, Andrew Hitchcock. He's not putting out an agenda. He's not promoting some philosophy. He just collected through history a set of quotes. And it's it's staggering to read these quotes. And uh, it's truly jaw-dropping. So it's no secret that certain people on Earth have observed that there is an anti-human, anti-goy agenda on this planet. Okay? Yeah. Uh, and so today, the situation in Europe is problematical because it is taboo to state the obvious. Now, when it is taboo to state the obvious, I mean, suppose we're living in a little village somewhere in Sweden and uh, suddenly eight or ten people come down with leprosy. So they're walking around in our little village and they've got leprosy. But, oh, you're not supposed to say they have leprosy. I mean, that would be total insanity. Yeah. And if the if the community conformed, complied with that taboo, that would be the end of the community virtually, right? Yeah. Because the leprosy could spread in the community and people would be in denial of it. So even when they got it themselves, they would say, oh, leprosy, what's that? You know, this is how bad it is. And this, the, the, uh, what's the saying of Voltaire? You know, if you want to know who's running the show, just ask who you can't criticize. Yeah. That's right. Who you can't talk about, you know? And, uh, so these are very obvious factors and they're becoming more and more obvious every day. And we could go on about that. But I would like to address something, if I might, that came to my mind, Hendrik, as I was listening to a few of your interviews on the topic of white genocide recently. It seemed to me that you had a question, which was a very valid question, and I had it myself. And that is, we're starting to wake up, some of us are starting to wake up now to this agenda, even though it has been clearly and explicitly stated uh, in certain writings and ideological scriptures, you know. But we're waking up to it in a state of, you know, of being stunned and baffled. Uh, I'll speak for myself here, but I think many people can relate. You scratch your head and you think, holy moly, how could it have gotten this far? And how come I didn't see it sooner? How come I didn't see it sooner? That's right. Well, I'd like to address those two questions, if I may. And I have to say that my, re- my response 
is not going to be easy. You may not like what I'm going to have to say, but I, to the best of my knowledge, I believe this explains why. Why this happens. I will give you two perspectives to consider, my friends, and they both come from Gnosticism. Okay? Gnostics taught that the Archons have no actual mind of intentionality. So it's not correct to say that they have a plan, these extraterrestrial mind parasites who work through human proxies. They don't actually have a plan. They are compelled by envy. And the Gnostics use this word, pathonos, the Greek word for envy, P-H-T-H-O-N-O-S. And they said that the operation of destruction conducted upon the human species by the archons and their proxies is a senseless act of envy, of destroying that which you want but cannot have. And I am also of the conclusion, although this is my little spin on Gnosticism, I have also concluded after much thought and much teaching, and many errors, some of which I corrected, some of which I didn't, that when the Gnostics defined humanity as the Anthropos, they defined it as a creature without envy. Now, I've contemplated that a lot, so let me put it in the form of a question so that you can contemplate it. Do you think it would be correct to say, as the Gnostics seemingly said, that the human animal, the anthropos, the true human being, has no envy? And that where envy appears in human behavior, it is due to an infection of something non-human. Now, this is a subtle parapsychological profile, if you will. Now, I submit to you that I am convinced that it is true that the true human animal has no envy. And one of the things that convinces me of this is that I don't have any. And I'm a human animal. So, how come I don't have any envy? What am I supposed to think of myself as some rare exception to the species? <laughs> I don't think so. You know, <laughs> I think I am. And, and I want to say what envy means. You know, I might want to you know, jump on the bones of my neighbor's wife, you know, love your neighbor, love your neighbor's wife, you know, that great biblical saying. <laughs> uh, and I might be jealous, you know, that he has this beautiful babe, or I might be jealous of somebody who has something that I want, but I don't go and destroy it so that they can't have it. That's envy. Right, yeah. Envy is the senseless destruction, which results in a condition where neither the person who has the desired thing nor the person who doesn't have it and want it gets it. Everything is lost. Envy is a, is a, is a zero-sum proposition. It's a complete failure. And so the envy of those, that special tribe of chosen people who made the pact with the archons is, what do they envy? Well, let me, let me put it together for you in a beautiful fairy tale fashion. The archons lied, telling them, we will give you the earth for your inheritance. Well, the earth doesn't belong to the archons. They can't give it to anyone. But the Aeon Sophia already gave the earth to humanity. Somebody envies that situation. Somebody envies the beauty of the human race, the simplicity, the genius of it. It's prodigiously talented. The variety of it, the innocence of it, particularly the innocence and its connection to the planetary animal mother. Somebody envies that. And because they can't have that, because they made a deal connecting them to an extra human pathology, they will then destroy it, and the earth they inherit, they don't realize, will be a wasteland, and then the archons will destroy them. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to put the whole story of the chosen people into a fairy tale, that's it. And it has a very, very bad ending. <laughs> okay? Yeah. So, one of the reasons, getting back to the main point here, stay on track, John. It's because you don't have envy, it's very difficult to see the, the insidious, nefarious, scheming, destructive insanity of people who do. That's why we haven't caught up with it. You know? 
It's like when you look at the world financial system. I only caught up with the world financial system about four or five years ago. And I had a wake-up call when I realized, hey, wait a minute. I remember in Santa Fe, I used to buy gas at 23 cents a gallon. Now it's like $4 a gallon. Yeah. Oh, why does gas get just more expensive? And why does the economy get worse? Well, I realized that it doesn't just happen that way. It happens because people make it happen that way. Yeah. You know? So when you realize that there is a deliberate factor of evil and destruction due to envy, you have to wake up. You have to not be naive. You use that word naive, and in a way it applies. But in another way, you know, it's not naivete. It's like you've got to be a warrior and you've got to realize that somebody's out to kill you. Well, exactly. I mean, that's – and this is where it's so difficult, I think, for a lot of people too because they've maybe spent many, many of years of their lives of trying to get to a place of nonviolence, compassion, love for everybody, love for, for, for life and the earth and the environment and everything, and it's, it's a you know, kind of happy place with their, with, that they're trying to achieve – and 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 into that picture, into that uh, play, you know, place that you're trying to create for yourself, comes this invading force of 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 rage and violence, and in their view, hate and and all the other nasty things that they've been trying to stay away from such a long time. Uh, right. I guess my point in this has been, if if you are part of a being that is on this planet, on this earth, it it, it doesn't matter what you wish it to be. Despite what some new age philosophies tell you, you are going. You're you're part as a player on that chessboard, if you want to use that analogy. And when 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 you're surrounded, you are faced with the option of trying to escape or or, or resolve the issue in some way, defending yourself, doing something about it. And this fundamental basis, this fundamental point, is something which has been very very cleverly inserted into, let's say, new age ideology and a lot of other these philosophies that are flying around out there, that there's try, there's a removal from, as you said, the human animal, the human being, from the natural world, the natural order, where even our most basic drives and responses and, and even functions of our very brain has been dismantled and deconstructed in front of us. And we now have a, a majority of people, I'd say, on this planet, which are in complete compliance, really, with the with the slave agenda, of, of not even being a human being, but being a perfectly fine domesticated uh, animal in their in their in their playpen, and this is something that people have to realize. This is not a natural state of a human being. No, it isn't. It's not natural at all. And I would I would sum up what you're saying, if I might, paraphrase it or put it into a proposition. To be a real genuine human being who wants all those good things, you know, who wants mutual aid and comes from love and generosity, and doing no harm. You want to be that, okay. But you cannot be that if you evade and deny the evil done by human beings. And you must see that you are implicated in that evil. And therefore, your responsibility for being human cannot really reside exclusively on playing the good side of human nature. It can't. Yeah. I, lo I love that saying, and I quoted this years ago in uh, some of the uh, writings I did on metahistory.org. The book, uh, The Serpent and the Rainbow, by Wade Davis, is about Haiti. Beautiful book. Incredible book about the origins of voodoo. Profoundly beautiful book. And in that book, he says that look into the mirror of evil, and you do not see the evil in yourself. What you see is the goodness in yourself. This is a really profound statement. Unless we look at this evil and face it brutally and nakedly, we can never know what it means to be really good people. Good people are people who face it, not try to deny and evade it according to these New Age formulas and forgiveness and all of the other conditioning that is actually used by the perpetrators in order to protect themselves. You see? Yeah, I am. I am convinced that the moment of truth has come, 